congratulations. Hi everyone, I'm Xin Hui. I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech in the Center for Trans Translational Research and Neuroimaging and Data Science. I'm also part of the OHBM Brain R Special Interest Group Web Science Communication Team. Today I'll be talking about interpretable, reproducible, and creative neuroimaging data visualization. Okay. Why should we care about data visualization? Why is it so important? Uh, first of all, it can help us to understand complex relationships and um, the data uh, that is not easily to observe from the raw data. Uh, we know that our brain gene data is very high dimensional. Uh, structural data includes three 3D spatial dimensions. Functional data includes four dimensions, uh, with one extra time dimension. Um, and each MI scans include thousands of vessels. Uh, so uh, it's very hard to see the uh, data pattern uh, without visualizing it. Um, and also, it can help us to uh, communicate our results to a broad audience. Uh, we usually say that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So visualization is usually more effective to communicate our ideas to a broad audience uh, than verbal description. Uh, if data visualization is so important, then what kind of visualization can be considered as good data visualization? Here, uh, I would like to recommend a book, uh, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Edward Tuft. Uh, Edward Tuft is an expert in graphical uh, presentation, and he wrote several books uh, on data visualization. Uh, this book is one of them. Uh, in this book, he used two concepts to, de to describe good data visualization. The first one is graphical excellence. Uh, graphical excellence is that which gives the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. It also means communicating complex ideas with clarity, precision, and efficiency. It means telling the truth about the data. The second concept is graphical integrity. It means clear, detailed, and thorough labeling should be used to defeat graphical distortion and ambiguity. It means uh, writing out explanations of the data on the graphic itself and labeling important events in the data. Okay. In this talk, uh, I would like to extend the definition of good data visualization in the context of neuroimaging research. What is good neuroimaging data visualization? I propose three axes, including interpretability, reproducibility, and creativity. We first need to properly interpret the data, uh, the high-dimensional neuroimaging data, uh, so that we can understand the data. Uh, after we have an interpretable figure, we also want to make it reproducible. Um, so reproducibility is also very important. Uh, and then uh, we also want to be creative because uh, it will be easier for people to remember our scientific story if we have creative figures. Okay, let's start with interpretable neuroimaging data visualization. This might sound surprising, um, but many new imaging studies, even published in peer-reviewed journals, um, fail to properly label variables or uncertainty, or indicate scale or uncertainty in the figures. Uh, as a result, we might not have enough information to interpret the figures. About a decade ago, uh, researchers investigated uh, 1,451 figures, including 2D and 3D data, from 288 articles published in 2010 uh, from six neuroscience journals. Specifically, they look for these four features in the figure. Is the dependent variable or quantity of interest labeled? Is the scale of the dependent variable indicated? Where applicable, is the measure of uncertainty display? Is the type of uncertainty, uh, for example, standard error bus or confidence intervals defined? 
Uh, here, panel A shows an example of how uh, these four features are indicated in the figure for 2D and 3D data, respectively. Okay, here's the question. What proportion of figures do you think meet all these four criteria for 2D data? Fifty percent. Does anyone have a different guess? Eighty. <laughs> Thirty. Okay. Then what about for three D data? Thirty percent. Is it lower than two D or higher? Much lower. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's take a look at the survey result. Okay. Uh, here, panel B shows uh, the mean proportion of figures uh, for each of these four criteria. Uh, we can see that uh, almost all figures of 2D data um, properly indicate uh, variables and scale, um, but about uh, 20 to 30 percent figures fail to indicate uncertainty. Um, and compared to 2D display, uh, over half of 3D displays uh, don't properly describe the dependent variable. That means that if you are asked what is being plotted here, you have no idea over half of the time. Um, yeah, uh, and also uh, only 20 percent of 3D figures uh, indicate the uncertainty of reported effects, and none of these figures uh, label the uncertainty. Um, this result suggests that uh, graphical displays become less informative as the dimensions and complex of data sets increase. Uh, here, panel C shows the mean proportion of figures uh, with uncertainty indicated for 2D categorical and continuous data. Uh, we find that um, the proportion of graphs display uncertainty is lower when data is continuous than when it is categorical. Only slightly above 60% uh, of figures properly indicate um, uncertainty for the continuous data. This survey result is shocking. Um, many published figures fail to meet this visualization criteria. Then how can we make sure that uh, we can properly visualize the data? Here, I would like to mention the visualization guidelines uh, covering six aspects uh, proposed by Elena Allen uh, and team in this paper. The first one is design. When we look at figure, uh, we can ask a list of questions. For example, is the display consistent with the model or hypothesis being tested? Are there any empty dimensions in the display that could be removed? And I would like to uh, highlight the third question. Does the display provide an honest and transparent portrayal of the data? We should avoid hiding, smoothing, or modifying the data. I will describe this point in detail in the next session. The next one is axis. When we plot the axis in the figure, uh, we need to make sure that uh, axis scales align with the data scales. Uh, usually, the visualization package sets the axis scale as linear by default, um, but if the data is in a different scale, such as a log scale, uh, we should change the axis scale to match the data scale for better visualization. Uh, and we need to make sure that uh, each axis label describes the variable and its units. Sometimes we might forget the units, but it's important to label them. Uh, also, we need to set up appropriate uh, axis limits and aspect ratio for the data. Okay, color mapping. Uh, when we choose a color map, we need to make sure that the color map characterizes the data properties. If the data is bipolar, we use um, diverging color maps. If the data is unipolar, use sequential color maps. If data is circular, use cyclic color maps. Also remember to uh, label the color bar axis to indicate the quantity, units, and scale.
Another important but often ignored aspect of visualization is uncertainty. Uncertainty characterizes variation in the data. Uh, we need to choose the correct type of uncertainty to describe the data and properly label uh, the type and unit of uncertainty. Okay, color. Um, there are some important factors to consider here. We cannot just choose our favorite color when we plot the figures. We want the color consistent with the natural interpretation. For example, we usually use red to indicate increases and use blue to indicate decreases. And sometimes the figure will be printed in grayscale. We also want to make sure that um, the features in the figure can be discriminated when it's in grayscale and we should avoid using a red and green contrast to accommodate a common forms of color blindness. Um, there are about uh, 300 million people in the world suffering from color blindness. I also have researcher friends who is red green color blind. Uh, so I think it's very important to keep this small thing in mind to make our community more inclusive. Okay, um, the last one is annotation. Uh, again, here is the list of questions we can ask ourselves uh, to make sure that the figure is properly annotated. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, for the uh, statistical procedure and criteria, uh, we should uh, describe um, the statistical type uh, and uh, significant threshold in detail for people to reproduce our finding. Okay, let's look at an example of graphical design. Given the same data, we can choose different types of plots to visualize the data. If we use bar plots, uh, we only display two numbers, here the mean and the standard error of the mean. Um, it's not very informative, and uh, it doesn't take advantage of the space either, because uh, the gray space in the bar plot doesn't convey any information. Uh, if we use box plots, uh, we can show more information about the distribution. Uh, here we show five numbers, including the minimum, maximum, and quartiles, and you provide more information for us to interpret the distribution. Um, if we choose the violin plots, we can see the shape of distribution. We can also overlay the violin plots with box plots to show statistics. Uh, this box violin plot uh, conveys the most information in these figures. Okay, here's the quiz. Uh, let's try to apply the guidelines that we just described to redesign this figure. Uh, here is the figure visualizing EEG flanker data. Uh, in the flanker task, subjects are asked to identify a target but to uh, ignore flanking items. Uh, here, the red and blue lines show event-related potentials for error trials and uh, correct trials, average over 10 subjects respectively. Uh, can you see any problems of this figure? If so, can you think of ways to improve this figure? Anyone has any ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Variability. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, titles, yeah, 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 yeah. That's also a good point. Anything else? Okay, let's take a look at the redesign figure. Um, previously, the figure only shows the average over 10 subjects, but we also want to show a variability or uncertainty in the data. So uh, here we show the 95% confidence interval, um, and we can control the transparency level so that the averages still stand out. Uh, we can also highlight uh, the onset of important events. Uh, here we can uh, set the time span for the uh, flankers and target um, as described there. Uh, and uh, it makes more sense to see the signals uh, start to fluctuate more uh, after the target event. 
uh, and we can also uh, specify the uh, statistical test uh, to see that these two trials are uh, different. Um, Okay, um, to summary, uh, in order to improve interpretability and new imaging data visualization, uh, we recommend uh, to consider the principles of graphical excellence and integrity, uh, and also uh, the visualization guidelines we just provided. Let's move on to uh, reproducible new imaging data visualization. Reproducibility has been an important topic uh, in new imaging studies in recent years. Uh, I will uh, discuss best practice uh, from a data visualization perspective uh, to uh, improve reproducibility and uh, our new imaging research. Uh, a problem that hinders reproducibility uh, is that many new imaging studies use opaque or nothing thresholding and present only the significant results. Um, but if you think about it, there are some problems with this conventional visualization approach. First of all, um, this opaque or nothing thresholding approach implies that our brain activity has been on or off like light bulbs. Um, but we know that it is fundamentally different from our understanding of brain behavior. The ball response is not a binary process, it's a continuous. Second, um, there is no universally accepted thresholding approach, uh, and the final results can be very sensitive to different thresholds. Um, third, uh, features that are not statistically significant can also be interesting, um, but this thresholding approach will hide all the potentially interesting features. And then uh, if you use this all or nothing thresholding approach, uh, meta-analysis across studies can produce incorrect interpretations. Studies have different power, sample sizes, effect magnitudes, and uncertainties. So even when using the same threshold, uh, what survives will be very sensitive to these different factors. So instead of the thresholding approach, uh, it's recommended to use a highlighting approach. Um, here is an example to visualize the results uh, with both the thresholding approach and the highlighting approach. Um, the figure on the top uh, shows the result with the thresholding approach uh, as used by many new agent studies. Um, and the panel B on the bottom uh, uses the highlighting approach. Uh, as we can see, uh, panel A only shows um, a few tiny clusters, uh, and the pattern is not symmetric. Um, but if we use the highlighting approach, uh, we can see the presence of uh, bilateral symmetry, and we can also see other functional net uh, network connectivity, uh, functional, net functional network activities. Yeah, so um, this highlighting approach presents more information uh, when we report the results. Okay, quiz time again. Um, based on the principle that we just mentioned, uh, let's redesign this figure. Uh, this figure visualizes a uh, statistically significant fossil of fMRI data and the auditory orbital task, uh, where participants respond to uh, target tones uh, presented within a series of uh, standard tones and novel sounds. Um, these SL slices show the difference between novel and standard beta weights uh, average over 28 subjects. Um, based on the highlighting of, uh, principle we mentioned, uh, can you think of how to improve this figure? Show it not significant, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. transparent? Yeah, yeah, show everything um, where non-significant is highlighted and transparent. Yes, yeah. Good points. Yeah, 
As Kevin said, uh, we can show the entire heat map, including all vessels. Uh, we can highlight the significant vessels with opaque color maps uh, and control lines. Um, but we can also show non-significant vessels uh, with transparent color map uh, controlled by t statistical magnitude. Um, just note that uh, when we use transparency, we should also indicate um, the transparency level and t statistic in the color map. Um, after we use this highlighting approach, uh, we can see um, the deformal network pattern um, that is not present uh, in the previous thresholding approach. Uh, also, this highlighting approach was actually proposed about 12 years ago, but it is still not widely adopted in the field. So uh, hopefully more people will start using this approach after this talk. Uh, this is the code uh, to reproduce this figure, so feel free to export this code to visualize your data. Okay, um, to improve reproducibility and new imaging data visualization, uh, here are our recommendations. Uh, we want to apply thresholds with transparency. We should avoid summarizing worldwide results as cluster peak locations. We should avoid summarizing our base results with only uh, super threshold regions. We should also avoid uh, masking results whenever possible. And we need to include and show more than just statistical results and provide um, detailed and meta information about analysis. Uh, if possible, we, sh we also recommend to share um, the visualization code on open platforms such as GitHub. Okay, uh, when we design a figure, uh, apart from making it interpretable and reproducible, we also want to be creative um, because it's easier uh, for people to remember uh, a figure that is different, creative, and easier for people to remember our scientific stories. Uh, I will show some examples of creative figures from recent literature. Um, these figures are from a paper titled Brain Charts for the Human Lifespan. Um, these figures are literally the brain charts for the human lifespan. Uh, if we look at this figure closely, we can see that it follows the several principles that we just mentioned. Uh, for example, uh, the figure in the upper left corner uh, shows the age distribution of each MI data set. It uses box violin plots uh, to show um, both the shape of age distribution and statistical properties. Uh, so it conveys the most information uh, across um, different data sets. Uh, and the figure on the right uh, is a graphical summary of the percentage of maximum value uh, for each MI phenotype and key developmental milestone uh, as a function of age. Uh, we can see important development milestones that are marked by circles and triangles, uh, where circles uh, depict the peak rate of growth milestones and triangles depict the peak volume. And this follows the principles of labeling uh, important events in the data. Okay, um, this is another great example of creative data visualization. Uh, this paper established normative models of biological age for three brain and seven uh, body systems. It extends the idea of brain age um, to other body organ systems. Uh, this paper uses uh, cartoon items to represent brain and body organ systems and clearly um, presents complex relationships um, such as uh, the influence of body age gaps uh, on brain age gaps and the association between uh, different environmental factors and organ-specific brain age. Uh, 
Um, this paper um, proposed the somatocognitive action network and motor cortex. Uh, you may have seen uh, the classic Penfield homoculus model from the textbook, uh, which claims that the motor cortex forms a continuous somatotopic homoculus extending down uh, the precentral gyrus from foot to face representations. Uh, here, researchers used precision fMRI data and found that um, the classic homoculus model is interrupted by regions with distinct functional connectivity, uh, alternating with effector specific areas, including foot, hand, and mouth. Uh, these inter effector regions show strong functional connectivity uh, to the network critical for whole body action planning. Uh, in this paper, uh, the, author, uh, the authors put the classic Penfield's homoculus model and their proposed model side by side. Um, and I find that it is a very powerful representation uh, to highlight how the proposed model is different from the existing one. Another paper I want to share uh, is a cross-species study. Uh, this paper develops methods uh, called Functional Connectivity Homology Index um, to quantify cross-species uh, regional similarities of functional organization. Um, the authors found that um, human macaque similarity exhibits the most pronounced changes in posterior region of the deformal network. Um, here, uh, panel A uh, shows um, the human macaque similarity among deformal network subregions that exceed the sparsity, sparsity threshold, uh, which is top 10% uh, of pairwise human macaque similarity across the entire cortex, um, as shown in panel B. Um, then panel C uh, visualizes the macaque uh, to human similarity maps for each deformal network region. Uh, and panel D represents the macaque to human similarity maps uh, along the human principal connectivity gradient. Um, I think the authors put a lot of thought and efforts uh, in this visualization. Uh, it highlights the links uh, between humans and macaques. Uh, it uses consistent colors to indicate the deformal network regions across panels, and it also connects the stories across the panel. So I also find uh, this is a very beautiful visualization. Okay, um, this is uh, all what I want to share. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, uh, as a reminder, feel free to leave questions or comments in the, um, in the app. Uh, there was one comment I want to highlight at, uh, at first, uh, that data visualization is also very helpful for scientists who may be neurodiverse or who have different cognitive abilities. So um, that's a great thing to keep in mind also, that um, the more detailed you can keep your um, visualizations, uh, the, the better they are at communicating broadly. Um, any other questions uh, here from the audience? So Xinhui, I, you uh, showed some really good examples. I was wondering if there are any uh, any other fields that you think do very well with data visualization that you think that neuroimaging can can learn from. Um. Okay. Um. So uh, one field that I personally feel very excited about is the generative AI, um, because we know that um, there are many AI models that can generate test figures, and uh, we also find that um, the uh, results from these generative AI models sometimes are very creative, um, that beyond human's imagination. So um, I think if we can um, utilize this AI model uh, when we design our figures, um, it will be very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I had one other question. Um, do you think about visualization differently if it's going for like a different medium, like for a talk versus a paper, or if it's going to different journals or different audiences? Do you think about visualization differently in those contexts? Or do you try to just make the best version that works in all contexts? Um. Um, I think there are some uh, similarity and also uh, differences. Um, 
I found that I actually can use um, the centralization for different medium um, to present, um, but uh, different types of presentation um, may require um, different focus and visualization. Um, Thank you. Um.